Hi, how's it going? So uh, famous, like that's, those are weird words to hear because I'm so not famous. I'm just a dude from Tampa, Florida, just trying to make my way. I want to start this morning where I hope to end, and that is to say thank you, just to have a second of gratitude for you to spend time in here listening to me speak. I want to show some gratitude to the folks who put this on, everybody who worked to put this on. These things are not easy to put on, and I just want to say thank you. So I'm going to start with thank you, and hopefully the last thing I say is also thank you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Coca-Cola. I've got a bunch of slides, and by the way, um, I'll just make you aware my team has a tendency when they do presentations for me, they change the order on me. So I have, actually haven't gone through this, so I'm not really sure what the order is going to be. They do it all the time, and sometimes they throw a weird slide in. Um, so if there's a weird slide, I just want to like, apologize in front, but it's my, it's my team. So I want to tell you a little bit about Coca-Cola. I'm here representing um, 133 years of of a company, a brand, an idea, um, and I stand here only as a result of all the people that have come before me. And my hope is that while some of these brands are in our hands, that we will leave them in a better place for the people that come, that come after us. So, okay, so first a little bit about, about our great brand and our great company, Coca-Cola. So I wanna start with our purpose. I think it's important that you understand what drives us, what motivates us, and what inspires us. So we used to have a much longer purpose. It was a couple of sentences, and you know, it was hard to, hard to memorize. And over the last year, we've tightened it up a bit. And it's just two simple things, to refresh the world and to make a difference. And those are the two fundamental things that when you come to work at Coke, you have to buy into. And for me, uh, anytime I get stuck with a problem at work or I'm, I just can't seem to find the answer to whatever question is puzzling me, I actually go outside of our auditorium where these words are on the wall. And I actually stand there and I read them and I think about what they mean. And nine times out of 10, it somehow gives me the answer uh, in terms of, of what I should do. So refresh the world and make a difference. That's, that's the goal of our company and all of our brands and all the people that, that work here. So we were founded 133, almost 144, I mean 134 years ago in Atlanta, Georgia by a guy named Doc Pemberton, who worked at a pharmacy called Jacobs, and he made a soda fountain drink, and the only way you could get it was through, through a soda fountain. And uh, that's the beginning, a super humble beginning of a company that has gone on to become one of the biggest, if not the biggest, soft drink brand in the world. But 133 years, and what's funny is we are just getting started. Um, there is so much growth and so much opportunity in front, of, in front of us. But for many, many years, we were just Coca-Cola. We had one brand in one country. And then when the Second World War came along, um, our uh, chairman, Robert Woodruff, said, I would like to have uh, our products available within arm's reach of desire. So that started a massive distribution network where our products were with arm's reach of desire. Also during the Second World War, he sent bottling equipment to Europe, and he said, I want every single US soldier to be able to buy a Coke for a nickel. And we set up bottling plants all throughout Europe where our troops were, were stationed. When the war ended, our troops came back and our bottling equipment stayed. And then we, we formed local businesses, local partnerships, and we built a bottling network. So our bottling network you know, spans the world. We were available in every country in the world, with the exception of North Korea and Cuba. Um, we, we, we hear we get snuck into North Korea sometimes, but we, I will not confirm that. <laughs> so um, just to give you a sense of scale for the company, we serve two billion drinks a day. Um, and um, I, I worked here many years ago. I worked at Coke for nine years, and then I left for 13, and I've just come back two years ago. And uh, 15, 16 years ago, we only sold a billion a day. So the company is on this, this, um, you know, this path to continue to double inside. But two billion drinks a day. We serve two billion drinks globally every single day. And the thing that we have to conti continually remind ourselves is that we're not entitled to two billion more tomorrow, that we've got to get up and we've got to earn, earn this each and every single day. And when I said, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the company, the new company that is evolving from a one soft drink brand to a, a company of brands and turning into what we're calling a total beverage company called Beverages for Life. So um, the average person drinks eight uh, non-alcoholic drinks a day. And when you think about the size of Coca-Cola, of those eight drinks, 
we get one of them. And we, for many years, we just had one brand pounding away. Now we're starting to think about thinking about individuals' beverage stacks and all the different things they drink. So we're in sparkling waters, still waters, uh, you know, teas, coffees, Topo Chico. If you've never had Topo Chico, it's a, it's a sparkling water from Mexico that is the official, uh, I think it's the official drink of Texas. It's like crazy how this brand, and it's, in and of itself is a cult brand. Uh, in fact, when I met with our president of the company uh, a year ago, we sat down and we started talking and he said, I have two things for you. And it's the first time we'd ever met. And I was like, okay, and the one, first thing was some random thing. And the second thing was, don't up Topo Chico. <laughs> and I was like, what? He goes, you hear me? Do not Topo Chico. So I came back and told the team, like, here's the goal. Do not Topo Chico. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so we're a, we're a company of brands, and, and I'm fortunate that I get to stand up here today representing Coca-Cola, but I'm also I'm representing the company. My team is responsible for marketing all of our brands in, in the U.S., so I go from one meeting in the morning on Coke to a Diet Coke meeting to a Peace Tea meeting. My days are, are crazy, and I have to constantly readjust my mindset depending on the room I'm in and, and the brand we're talking about. So, so I, you know, I, talk a little bit, I talked a little bit about our past. We've been around for a long time. We are the uh, most recognized trademark in the world. And uh, for many years, this is what we stood for. We stood for, we've always sort of stood for bringing people together in, in, in times of crisis and just times of just normal life, bringing simple moments together and, and refreshing the world when we can. So uh, I'll show you a little bit more of this later on, but the, our past is, is filled with, with great iconic advertising and we're in a world today that we can't rely on big giant advertising anymore. We have to change and we have been working pretty aggressively to change the way we market and the way we think about about consumers. So I'll tell you a little story about, because it came up last night. And by, by the way, last night, if you were there, um, I flew, <laughs> flew from Atlanta, got in a car, and got here as fast as I could, and came in about five minutes before I was awarded the thing. So I was sitting down like, oh shit, oh, got here. And then I went up on stage, so it, it all happened super fast for me, so it was really, really weird. So, um, so I appreciate you kind of sticking with my little, I was a little off last night. So. So anyway, I'm going to tell you a story about Stranger Things. Anybody watch the show? Yeah. Anybody not watch the show? Get on it. Come on. <laughs> Damn. So, um, so if you watch the first two seasons of Stranger Things, Coca-Cola was integrated naturally into the, to the storyline uh, throughout the first two seasons. And it had absolutely nothing to do with us whatsoever. It was just a dumb luck thing. And uh, the third season, they came to us and said, there's a scene that we've written into one of the episodes that we have to share with you. And it's going to lead to a potential opportunity that we want to talk to you about. So um, this was a, a, an example for us of just stepping back and thinking completely differently about, about how we go to market with an idea. And then also about us facing our past. We, we launched a product called New Coke in the summer of 1985. Some of you probably weren't even born then. But it was a huge mistake. <laughs> like it's, it's often uh, referred to as the biggest mistake in the history of marketing. Uh, so no pressure at all. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a ghost that haunts us at Coke. It's always in the room. And it's always the thing no one wants to talk about that it ever happened. But it's like it's there. It's always there. We've never really faced it before. So this, this gave us the opportunity. So I'm going to show you a quick video just to show you kind of how we integrated. And I'll tell you the story behind it in a second. How do you even drink that? Because it's delicious. What? It's like Carpenter's The Thing. The original is the classic. No question about it. But the remake? <sighs> Sweeter, bolder, better. You're insane. So you prefer the original thing? What? No, I'm not talking about the thing. I'm talking about New Coke. It's the same concept, dude. Uh, actually, it's not the same concept. It is the same concept. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Hey! Sorry. Sorry. So the Duffer Brothers, the guy who, the two guys that, uh, that developed the show, worked this into the script. 
And this was exactly the conversation that was happening in 1985 between people. Some people liked it, most people didn't, and then the world just sort of revolted against it. So I was in my office, big time, <laughs> big time. Uh, there are people that still like shake uh, when, when you bring up new Coke, and I had to handle a couple of them when we did this project. Um, but I got a call, we got a call from uh, Netflix, and I'll back up for a second. I had two meetings uh, six or eight months before, one with our, our uh, global chief growth officer that said, you need to be doing things that break the internet. And I was like, wow, that's kind of weird. That's a weird brief. And I can't believe you said internet. Like, who says that? <laughs> so that was a brief that we were given. You got to do things that are, are such culturally relevant that they literally break the internet. And then I had a meeting with James Quincy, our CEO, who said to me, what are you going to do about Netflix? What are you going to do about the subscri subscription services that don't show advertising? How are we going to work with them? So we had been having conversations with Netflix, and we'd had a couple of opportunities, but nothing seemed to be right. It, everything felt super forced. So the uh, Netflix folks called us, and we, I answered the phone, and the guy said, um, hey, are you sitting down? And I'm like, yeah, totally. And I was walking around my office. He goes, no, I need you to sit down. So I'm like, all right, OK, what's going on? Is some, you know, something bad? And he's like, listen, uh, I just came from a meeting with the Duffer Brothers, and uh, they uh, have this idea that you guys should bring back new Coke. And uh, I'm like, are you? No, that is so not going to happen. No, 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 no. No. And he's like, dude, you got to listen to me. I'm like, absolutely no. I, I, no. I, if I get asked somebody, if I ask somebody, I'm going to get fired. It's like, dude, just think about it. And then I was like, dude, that is such a good idea. <laughs> How can we not do that? So we got a couple people in a room, and we started to talk about it. And we all went through the stages of like, oh my god, no way. We cannot ask to do this. But dude, we totally got to ask to do this. So, so we went up the ladder, and we asked. And um, you know, James Quincy, our CEO, was like, do it, without even hesitating. Do it. And again, this is our biggest skeleton in the history of our company. Do it. Just go. Make it happen. That sounds great. And it was a moment for me that represented a new way of thinking at Coca-Cola, of facing our fears, facing our mistakes, learning from our mistakes, and moving on. So we brought the, the Netflix team to Atlanta, and we went through the archives. And these are the actual boxes where all of the records, the project was called Project Kansas. That was the secret project name for New Coke, Project Kansas. I have no idea why, but super random name. But we have three boxes of all the original documents uh, and all the newspaper clippings, but all the history of New Coke. So we dug through that because we wanted to make sure that our involvement with, um, with Netflix and with Stranger Things was, in, was completely as authentic as it could be. So we got the old graphics from the can, and we actually snuck into one of our bottlers at 4 o'clock in the morning with these cans with the, with the actual formula of New Coke, and we produced about 100,000 cans of new Coke. And we kept it super quiet, and we only told a couple of people. And, um, and the idea was just to sort of have a little bit of fun, poke fun at ourselves, and uh, to you know, attempt to break, to break the internet. So it went from Netflix sort of saying to us, we got an idea, to us saying, that can't happen, to yes, let's go for it. Let's do this. And, we didn't really know what we had. We didn't, you know, we kind of sat in a room and thought, yeah, we're going to be the ones that bring back new Coke. Only you only get to bring back new Coke one time. And this could be another huge screw up. And we could all be unemployed on Monday. <laughs> but like, what? You know, I'd, rather, I'd rather be unemployed on Monday and going out swinging than sitting, uh, just sitting and not doing anything. So, so anyway, we brought back new Coke. Um, it was a big deal. Um, and now, this is the, story. the completely oversimplified story of how Stranger Things and Coca-Cola teamed up. Coca-Cola has always been an organic part of Stranger Things. And it doesn't hurt that the two iconic brands share the same zip code. So when Netflix came to talk to us about the new season, we couldn't help but notice that it takes place in the summer of 1985. Hmm, wonder if anything interesting was happening at Coca-Cola back in the summer of 85. Coca-Cola is in for a real change. <gasps> is a more harmonious flavor. Oh yeah, wasn't that the summer that Coca-Cola changed Doc Pemberton's 99-year-old secret formula and announced new Coke and kind of rubbed some people the wrong way? Protests ensued, letters were written, feelings were hurt, and apologies were made. After making this discovery, someone said, here's a crazy idea. What if we created a throwback Stranger Things and Coke commercial? 
reskinned our website to look like something out of 1985, advertised like it's 1985, made limited edition packaging, and merch. Built an upside down vending machine that looks like it's from the upside down, and helped Burger King launch their upside down Whopper. Everyone nodded their head. And then someone at Netflix said, you know what would be absolutely crazy? If we re-released new Coke. We all had a good belly laugh. And Coke said, too bad we can't do that. We can't do that, right? I mean, we can't, can we? New Coke. Yes, that new Coke. The formula from 1985. It was only available for a limited time, but long enough to break the internet. Rewriting the history books by turning one of the most famous marketing disasters ever into a pop culture phenomenon. So we had a little bit of fun with this. Um, one, of the, one of the areas of focus for this conference was, uh, the, Ryan told me, it's the idea of courage. And this is, uh, I think, an example of a team of people who had the courage to you know, face something that was a massive failure uh, with the potential to, to fail. But courage was what it took to, to sort of make this happen. So a couple more slides. We, we did. We reskinned our, our uh, site like it was 1985. And uh, literally, we sold uh, New Coke on the site. And within five minutes, the site was down. Um, so I did, we did, in fact, break the internet. <laughs> Uh, and I got a call from my boss. He's like, our site's down. And I'm like, well, we accomplished a brief. <laughs> <laughs> Winning. <laughs> he did not laugh at all. <laughs> Nothing, there was no humor on the other end of the line. I'm like, come on, dude. We drove 4 billion media impressions in 24 hours when we announced it. It was the biggest thing. Like, it was absolutely global, worldwide. You couldn't turn around without somebody somebody reporting on it. So we had a lot of fun with that. That was courage. I'll show you a couple other things that we're doing. Um, Disney is that we have a huge partnership with Disney. And you know they have Star Wars. They just built the Star Wars parks at Disney. And uh, they, would, they, they refused to have any product in there that wasn't authentic to the world. So we, we spent two years with Disney developing specific packaging to fit within the, the Star Wars world. And we launched this. And you can only get this. Uh, at Disney. So we have Coke, Diet Coke, Sprite, and, and Dasani um, in different packaging specific for, for Disney. We had a lot of fun with this as well. So this is us, just an example of us just taking the things that we take for granted. And, you know, the con we, we treat our contour bottles. It's a precious, precious um, uh, thing for us. But this is opportunities for us to get into different packaging and, and just have a little bit of fun. So I'll show you this one real quick. What was that? Anyway, we had a little fun with this. We, we created special coolers to be con super consistent with the world of Star Wars and just, just had a little fun. And if you saw in, uh, in Asia, we actually had a label that you, um, when you touched the label, the lightsabers came on from two of the characters and the lightsabers started to fight. So we had a little bit of fun. We've had a little bit of fun with this. So um, yeah, just an example of some, some weird stuff we're doing. And then we recently just an, uh, introduced an energy drink. Like Coke was positioned early on as the first original energy drink. And for years, we've been sort of away from the energy category. And we decided to come into the energy category. The energy category is really dominated by Red Bull and Monster. And their positioning is very distinct. And uh, we saw an opportunity to bring an energy drink to all the people that sort of, sort of don't buy into having a massive size can with a big Monster M on it. Um, so we, we just introduced Coke Energy, and I'll show you the spot we were in the Super Bowl. This Justin is 
Jonah Hill going to flake out on Martin Scorsese? The world wants to know. Come on, Jonah, come on. Jonah! You gotta answer that. Everyone's waiting. So not the best commercial we've ever done, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> um, but the scores for Persuasion and what it's intended to do scored off the charts. A quick backstory about this, the reason I show you this is because this is an example of sometimes when you're dealing with creative talent, sometimes it's good to listen to the creative talent and have them give input to the work that you're doing. We, when we, we got the script, we immediately knew we wanted Jonah Hill. We, we couldn't see the spot with anybody but Jonah Hill. So we, we talked to Jonah and we said, you know, here's a script. We'd love you to do it. He's, he's in um, conversations. I'm like, you need a buddy. We need you to have like, like a friend. Is there anybody that you would recommend? And he was like, oh, dude, we got to get my buddy. And again, we're one of these phone calls where you're like, OK, what, what, what's, who's your buddy? No, my buddy would be amazing. And we're like, OK, well, who, who's that? Martin Scorsese. And we're all like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Say that again? Martin Scorsese, dude, and we were like, oh, yeah, that, okay, cool. So we got, we got Jonah Hill and Martin Scorsese to do something that neither one of them ever really do, and that's to show up in this spot, and both of them were amazing, absolutely amazing to work with. And what we've, then we it sort of expanded, and it's the first time we'd used Alexa to, actually, you could order, you can't do it anymore because we're all out, but you could ask Alexa to send you Coke Energy, and we would send you samples through, through Amazon. We had a huge, huge partnership with with Amazon to, to kick this off, and we're in the process of, of giving out seven million samples around, around uh, North America in the next couple of months. So big, big launch. Is, again, it's an example of us evolving into new product categories and doing new things. Last thing, uh, and super simple, and I'll just kind of rifle through this, but um, the world sucks right now, right? I mean, social media is just, it sucks. Like, it's great, but it sucks, because everyone's so mean to each other, right? There's so much bullying, and there's so much just, like, hate being thrown back and forth at each other. And our social media team came to me one day and said, hey, man, everyone's so angry on Twitter, and just so angry. And I had been looking at our social media feed, and I was at the NCAA championship in Minneapolis, and we posted a photograph of a Coke bottle with some backdrop and it said, we're at the NCAA Final Four. And I saw the post and I was like, and you're not. Like, we were literally posting lame pictures of our product and talking, bragging about where we were and sending it to people that weren't there. It was, we were just wasting our time. So we reset. We literally wiped all of our social feeds clean and we reset. And on World Kindness Day, we reset and we, our objective is to be the most optimistic, uplifting brand on social media. So we, yes. So we uh, kind of like met artists from all over the world and we just turned it over. We said the brief is about be nice to people. And if you can look at our feeds now, we're trying very, very hard to be super positive in everything that we do. And just remind people that like, take a second and like be nice to somebody, you know, don't, don't, don't do the hate thing. So, so anyway, this is a, a look at some of the stuff that we've done. Um, we, uh, our brand management team on Coke didn't know we were doing this, and they were super pissed off because they wanted like, the 20-ounce you know, bottle shot at the, at the basketball tournament. But we decided to do something more, more meaningful. And our positive sentiment has gone through the roof as a brand, and we think it's a good thing to do. And I invite other brands who are in the room, I challenge you to step up and do the same thing. Like, we, are, we need to be the ones responsible for changing the tone of the dialogue, particularly as it relates to bullying online. So do something good with your platform, your brand, your opportunity. Do something, do something good. Do something mean, meaningful. So anyway, the examples of a couple things that we've, that we've done. So when we think about the future, we're throwing all the old stuff out. Like, we're... we're there are no sacred cows anymore at Coke, and we're trying very hard not to do the same old big ad, uh, throw it out through the, through the media channels, and really starting to think 
very differently about how we approach each and every one of you as people, as humans. Um, gone are the days, hopefully, of us walking into a room and interrupting you, right? We, we think about how we market our brands. I'm, I, I went to Florida State University, so I'm not that smart. I'm not good at math or spelling, but other than that, I'm pretty good. But I'm, so I have to break things down and make it super simple. And I think of how we market brands in today's world as if you're an invited guest at a dinner party. So you walk into the dinner party, and it's all going on. Everyone's talking. And if you were to walk into a dinner party and step up on a chair and tell everyone, hey, I'm here. Look at me. I'm here. People would be like, what? You're like, no, no, no. Hey, look, no. enough about you. Let's talk about me. Like, come on. I want to tell you about myself. And you'd be sort of kicked out pretty quickly, and you wouldn't be invited back. And in my case, that would be amazing, because I hate dinner parties. <laughs> my wife drags me, and I have to, always have to make a choice when I go to a dinner party. Do I want to be a jerk and get, not get invited back and get in trouble, or do I want to be nice? So, but, but think about that as a brand, that you're interrupting people's lives, and you're not really thinking about them and their, and their way of thinking or what, where their mindset is. So take the time to enter the room figure out what's going on, and then find ways to add, add value. Add value whenever you can. So, so again, the idea of refresh the world and make a difference is what we're, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to be all about. And uh, I'll show you one last video, and then we can do some, some q and I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle dove. Now there was a time So I'll end where I started, and I'll say thank you. And I'll leave you with one thing. Um, we all have an opportunity to make a difference in, with what we do. And it's our opportunity to leave conferences like this and go back to our offices and our brands and our agencies and our partnerships and to put it into play and to make a difference and to have the courage to not just follow what everyone else has done. So my challenge to you is that uh, do what hasn't been done because the things that have been done have already been done. So thank you. Oh, wow. Now Thank you. <laughs> Seems like I've been waiting for this for four years. <laughs> I don't never, if you I'll weren't there last it. night, I was invited to do this four years ago when I was the CMO of Converse. And uh, the week of the event, I got fired. And uh, it was amazing. So I had to call and say, hey, I, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't come because I don't work there anymore. And uh, so Ryan was like, what? <laughs> so for four years, we've been trying to get this back. So as I said last night, um, this week, before I left, I was super nervous when HR called me. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Do not fire awesome. me this week, so maybe next week. We'll jump right into it, because I think oh, the last question that people out there are probably not thinking is, yeah, but you're Coke, Jeff. You can do these things. We can't. What can the small brand learn from Coke that's sitting in this audience? That's, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think Coke, uh, big brands are a blessing and a curse. 
because when they get so big, you can't actually turn and you can't actually do new things. Uh, I would say let your consumer tell you what you should do. You know, the way we built Converse was we just asked, and it was a super small brand at the time. We, we went to China and we asked musicians in China what we could do to help. And they told us that they always wanted to play their music in another city. So we bought a, we bought a tour bus and we put them on tour and like it changed everything because we just asked. So I would say just start small by asking your consumers what you should do and they'll tell you and then if you do it, 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 it works. It's weird that yeah. way. It, it is true. I think uh, a lot of people can take uh, Coke. You, you talked about at the beginning. Coke was a small brand to begin with, too. And I think a lot of people forget that. And mm -hmm. They still act the same way they did back in the day. Let's get personal for a minute. What was your first job in marketing? Uh, my first job out of college, I worked for Procter & Gamble, and I w started in sales, and I sold Folgers coffee and Citrus Hill orange juice to grocery stores that were smaller than this room. Um, and I had to call on 10 of them a day and uh, I learned the meaning of the word no. And uh, then uh, I went to work in uh, the paper category in Cincinnati. I worked on the Charmin brand. I also worked on the Always brand, which uh, was a super interesting learning experience for me. <laughs> um, yeah, that taught me I could do anything after I did that job. <laughs> and through those early years, did, was there a time when you just realized um, the greatest leaders really lean on a couple of strengths, right? They're not good at everything. What, what, what is yours, and when did you realize that unique ability, that, um, and what is that? Uh, I'm, I'm not really that good at a lot of things. Um, Come on. No, I, I, uh, I think what I've learned over the course of my life is to be able to look at a situation or something in front of me and flip it over and think about it differently. Um, I don't spend any time in my day looking at what other brands are doing because we're all marketers, me included, are just a bunch of copycats. So I try very hard to think about how I could approach things from the other side in a different way. When I got to Converse, I'd come from Coca-Cola. I worked at Coke for nine years, and I left for 13. And when I was at Converse, my, my brief to myself inside my head was, what would Coke do? And then I would say, I'm going to do the opposite. And I did, and it worked. So um, it's just the ability to, to not get caught up in, like, this is the way we always do it. It's amazing. Uh, you can tweet uh, questions. They'll show up on my phone here, uh, TGS underscore Coke, and I'll ask uh, questions from the audience. And at the end, I might give two or three people a chance to grab the mic and ask you a question. Um, we talked about Converse, so go back in your career a bit. That's when I met you. Um, and uh, at that time, you were a little bit into rubber tracks. It was starting, or it was just wrapping up. Uh, tell people what that is and how big of a risk that was and the story about it um, and how it affected culture. Yeah, so it's a story about, again, about courage. Um, when I interviewed for my job at Nike, Converse is owned by Nike, um, someone asked me during the interview, have you ever gone all the way? And I thought that was a super weird question to be asked in an interview. <laughs> I was like, dude, that's kind of personal. Uh, but he said, no, I mean, like, have you ever believed in something so much that you'd put it all on the line? Like, you'd, you'd walk away. If it doesn't, if it doesn't, if they won't let you do it. And I was like, wow, that's a crazy question. No, I haven't. But wow, I'm ashamed of that. So I promised that guy that day that someday I would do that. And uh, like I said, we did the thing in China. Then we came back to the States and we were in Brooklyn and we were working with all these young up and coming musicians. And we said, what could we do to help? And they said, uh, I'm a bartender uh, or I'm a barista and uh, I'm in a band and I really want to pursue music, but I can't afford to get like a demo because uh, I can't afford to get in a studio. There's no studio time. There's no rehearsal time. So I was like, cool, you want us to build a studio? And they were like, that would be cool. So I went back to Converse, and we said, hey, we want to build a studio, and we want to make it all about giving back, saying thank you to musicians who aren't signed, who don't have the means to get into a studio. So we built a 5,000-square-foot studio in Brooklyn. We then built another one in Boston. We built one in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. And uh, we just opened it up, and we didn't own any of the content, and we just gave every, it was, it was a total give back. It was just, you know, the artist would say, what's the catch? And I'd say, there's no catch. Nah, dude, there's, what's the catch? And I was like, oh, we're totally marketing to you right now. We're totally marketing to you right now, but we're so not going to take anything from you. We're doing it by giving you something. So we recorded with over 5,000 artists over five years. It cost me to run the studio for five years what one eight-week flight of TV cost in the United States one time. So the opportunity cost was incredible, and we made a difference in 
in uh, many, many people's lives. I call it my midlife career crisis, where I felt like I needed to spend some of corporate America's money to do something good. And um, it's a thrill for me. We don't ever talk about who recorded in there, but it's a thrill for me to go to Coachella and uh, Bonnaroo and other festivals and see some of these bands that had their first chance at recording in our studio now headlining a uh, massive tour. So it was, a, it was well, super I, I, fun. Well, I interviewed you four years ago, and then I went and fact-checked it. And uh, I actually talked to some artists, and it's amazing what Jeff and his team did because they're like, they got their album done, some of them made it, and they were like, what, can we put your name on the album? And Jeff and his team were just like, no, it's yours. It was just pure, and I think that's what marketing should be in co-creation. I'm, I'm proud of you for doing that. Oh, thanks. Um, and I think it might have glossed over. It didn't for me, but did you guys hear that? Like, for your career, whether you're a marketer here, a doctor, a lawyer, we have different people in this audience, and you need to go all in on stuff. And I think what he just said, I hope it doesn't go over one's head, like, no matter what part of your career you're in. Yeah. It's so important. So the, the, so I, I got the studio approved, and then I went to Asia for a trip, and I came back, and I was walking down the hall, and our CFO said, hey, your uh, budget got pulled for the studio. So I was like, oh, what? And uh, he said, yeah, you're, we're not doing the studio. So I, I walked directly into our CEO's office without thinking through anything. So in hindsight, I probably would have done this differently. Um, I walked in and said, uh, literally, uh, I dropped the F-bomb. You, I quit. And he was like, what? Like, that, what? And I'm like, I quit. Like, I quit. I came here, and you told me we could do this kind of stuff, and now you're not letting us do it? You, Nike sponsors soccer tournaments. This is my soccer tournament. Like, what are you talking? I quit. I'm out. And then the other side of my brain was like, whoa, don't do that. <laughs> so then I said, you know what? You're going to fire me. Literally, I flipped, and I, he goes, what? I go, you're going to fire me. All CMOs get fired. Like, we all get fired. Like, when you become a CMO, the last two words in your book are you're fired. So when you get your, you know, your little notebook, write you're fired at the end, and then everything you write in between, it's all good, but it ends the same. <laughs> you're fired. And it's so great to get fired. It's amazing. Um, because, uh, you know, you can get fired for sitting in your ass and not doing anything, or you can get fired for, like, doing crazy stuff. So I said to him, you're going to fire me. I, I want you to fire me over this. And uh, he was like, well, you just quit, so how can I fire you? I'm like, you know what I'm talking about. Why don't you fire me over this? <laughs> so he said, uh, you know what? Uh, okay, you're on. So I shook his hand, and we made a deal. And I said, if it sucks, you can fire me. And, uh, and then I lived uh, another eight years at Converse, and he got fired like a year later. <laughs> so, yeah, it was great. But, but it was that moment like, of just like, I have to do this. This is the right thing to do. And it was like, well, how are you going to measure it? And I'm like, I don't know. It's never been done before. Well, I mean, like, how are you? I don't know. We're going to make it up. We're just going to do it. These kids need this. The ass is for it. We should give it to them. And that was, that was it. And I was so passionate about, about the idea that I was willing to, to quit. And that night when I went home and told my wife the story, she was so not happy with me. <laughs> she was like, so how did it end? And I'm like, well, I'm going back tomorrow. <laughs> You're, you have some proud moments, and that's one of them in business, but you're also a, a proud dad. And uh, let's talk about seeing your daughter become, a, become world famous and an artist. How has that been it's, And uh, to watch? Because I'm, uh, I love your business story, but I also know you're fiercely loyal, and, and uh, you're an awesome dad, so talk about that. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I have two uh, beautiful daughters. One is 23. She works in advertising in Boston. Uh, I, I, I recommended against it, but she was like, no, I'm, I'm following you into marketing. So she works at an agency in Boston. And I have a 21-year-old daughter who, um, at the age of 13, we moved from Seattle. When she was a little bit younger, we moved from Seattle to Boston. We lived in a very small town, and she got bullied. Uh, she was an outcast, kind of a creative kid. And uh, ooh, hang on one second. Um, anyway, God, sorry. She uh, used art to get through it and is now, um, man, sorry, uh -huh. is, is now playing uh, every major music festival in the world. And it's super fun to watch just to be a dad who literally, when she plays, does, does this. So I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> let, let us step in here for a minute. Sorry. sorry. Hold on. Let's, so, no, this is good. 
and talk about bullying and, and he, the coke stuff it comes from his heart and what they're doing because so I've known Jeff and we've given friends and we've never done business together we probably never will uh, and I love that we just don't we just have a great relationship and as she's becoming famous and she's incredible check her out um, what's her Instagram her name is Claro yeah check it out uh, her name is Claire but when she was getting bullied she posted stuff on SoundCloud and YouTube and she put it under the name Claro because she didn't want anybody to know it was her. Yeah, and, and people gave him shit because he's a big shot and his daughter's being, becoming famous and they try to like tie it to him and it's totally not. She's done it and you just see the passion there. And I wanted to say in front of everyone, I'm so proud of her and you. Yeah, thanks. And uh, just fucking push through. Yeah, I mean, um, we ha I'm, I had nothing, she's we unreal. had nothing to do with what happened out of her bedroom. She had a video explode when she was getting ready to be a freshman in college and uh, she's now touring the world. She just, last week, uh, NME Magazine in the UK, uh, Music Awards, she won Best New Act in the World. And it is... Uh, I'll, I'll disagree with you. You're her dad, so you probably did a lot, because you're her dad, and you raised her. Yeah, no, my it's, it's all amazing. my wife, though. My it's wife's amazing. amazing. My wife is way, way cool. All right, let's jump to some questions. We'll take five more minutes here. Uh, good Starts Here One asks, I'm a collector of Coca-Cola, even have a tattoo. That's amazing. Plastic. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where uh, are you? Stand up. You might not, you might not want to ask Stand up. You had. don't know something, but I already have something on the way to your house. Wow. That's yes, amazing. I'm sending you a can of new Coke. Amazing. That's huge. I am. Your <laughs> husband pulled me aside this morning and said, my wife has a, tattoo, a Coke tattoo, and I was like, all right, what's your address? That's amazing. <laughs> So uh, I, That's thank legit. I thank you. That is legit, man. Get, That's get this. On that note, when I was at Converse in Boston, I told him I like these shoes, and I'm like wearing them today. And he didn't say anything. Uh, these were spe special editions. And didn't say anything. And I literally, before I got home, my wife's like, there's a box here from Converse. And uh, here they are. So he's yeah. good for it. It's the kind of guy so he it's, is. So it's, it's on the way. It was supposed to be a surprise, but like, oh, sorry. you asked us. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and I would have one, too but I know I'm going to get fired, so oh, yeah. <laughs> I call. wouldn't know what to do with it afterwards. That's so awesome. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Uh, plastics, <laughs> plastics from straws to grocery yeah. bags are beginning to be banned. Yeah. Has Coca-Cola looked at how they can become a leader in creating better alternatives for yes. uh, products? Yeah, the video that we started with was a little bit about our sustainability approach. Um, yeah, plastic is a problem. Like, it's an issue. And uh, is an issue that we are facing head on. I, I, I want to start by saying, go back to our purpose around uh, refreshing the world and making a difference. People that work at Coca-Cola are not evil people. It's easy to paint a big corporation as an evil empire, but we're filled with people who are mothers and fathers and parents and sons and daughters who give, uh, who care deeply about the world and do not want to ruin it. So we are aggressively looking at uh, re using re more recycled plastics, more aluminum, more glass, uh, in some cases, packageless uh, opportunities with, that we're doing with water, much like what um, the company Tableau. Tableau is doing outside, which is phenomenal, by the way. Like, whoever totally is here from that company, Tableau. like, way to go. Nice job. Um, but we're tackling it. Our, uh, James Quincy, our CEO, uh, constantly says, in five years, there will be nothing more uncool than being seen with a plastic bottle in your hand. So we are aggressively attacking this. Uh, will we ever get completely out of plastic? Probably not, but our goal is to, for every bottle that we sell, is to collect a bottle and to put them right back into to recycle plastic, so creating the loop. Um, one of the biggest uh, opportunities around recycling is that many uh, cities don't recycle. And uh, I think for a while we kind of sat back and said, well, that's a problem. And now we're kind of saying, well, that's a problem. We should fix it. So we're investing millions of dollars in, in either helping cities or creating our own, uh, our own way to recycle and reclaim uh, plastic, whether it's ours or from other companies, to then put back into to recycling. So it's something that we're taking very seriously. Um, and uh, I can assure you that there are uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people in Atlanta and all over the world that work for us that are working on this this very issue right right this very minute so on that the, the questions are rolling in here just to add on to that uh perkins natasha says uh, does coke see an opportunity around western canada hemp plastics as a sustainable option do you know anything about that sorry what western canada hemp plastics as a sustainable option i i, I do not i don't know i'm 
That's it, a good question. I, I can I can find out. Check into it. Yeah. Uh, We're not advice? getting into cannabis, by the way, though. Okay. So just, <laughs> I got asked that this morning. I want to make that perfectly clear. That's not. Do not do not misquote me, please. Okay. Uh, Impress Jade says it's a pretty strong title. That's a great. Uh, uh, what advice, if any, would you give to your 21-year-old self? Oh man, that's a great question. To my 21-year-old self, would be um, don't take yourself so seriously when you're young. Like, learn that it's not about you. Uh, your job is never like I have this great job; it's amazing. But like someday I won't have it anymore, and someone else will have it. And uh, it, you know, it's not it's not about you. It's about um, you giving, not you taking. And then as a 21-year-old or 23-year-old first-time manager, um, I, I teach lots of people coming into the company that are new managers. Like, it's not about control. Like, a lot of people want to get their first job and they want to be in control. It's never about control. And the sooner you learn to let go of control and embrace the chaos, um, the better leader you'll wind, up, you'll wind up being. So don't take yourself so seriously and just lighten up. Let go. I'm getting the flashing light for a while here. Jeff, thank you so much uh, for joining us.